Hi, folks, and welcome back to MMA Talking Heads. I'm Jason Probst, your host. Joining us this week is a co-host of the show, and welcome back to Danny Costa. Danny, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Well, I know you're an old-school Pride fan, as am I, Danny, and uh, obviously you've got to feel uh, the blood pumping through your veins after uh, UFC on fuel, Vanderlei Silva against Brian Stan, and we're going to get to that in a second. Um, but uh, coming out of Japan, so we had a, you know kind of some good uh, Pride-style flashbacks. A couple interesting fights on the bottom of the televised card. Uh, Dong Hyun Kim taking the decisions against Sihar Bahadura. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Bahadura. We're nice, nice. I mean, uh, kind of the stun gun doing the stun gun thing, right? Shutting him down. Um, did you learn anything from this fight other than that he's a stifling grappler from the top? No, but, you know, he dealt with a really dangerous striker. I think it showed us more about Sihar the Great than it did uh, stun gun, but... With that said, you know, it was a great win for Stun Gun. He's been looking better in his stand-up. Uh, he came forward. I think that was the impressive thing is he put yeah, Sierra uh, on the defensive and Sierra couldn't counter it. And that was very, very... ...progressed uh, since he got knocked out by Carlos Conde. He's really made a conscious effort and is showing in the octagon. Yeah, you know, I thought it was really like, you know, if you're running the, the ball for four yards in a cloud of dust, keep running the ball. You know, I mean, <laughs> like, it's working, it ain't broke, and uh, I don't fix it. And, like, maybe it wasn't the most crowd-pleasing thing, but that's one thing I like uh, about crowds in Japan is I knew that anybody booing was probably an American, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty interesting to see, hear them boo. Uh, you don't really see right. that with the TV Right, show. it's usually too classy to do that. But then my buddy, I was watching, he's like, yeah, those are probably the American meatheads that Dana gave tickets to in their affliction shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to the next card, uh, fighting the card, Ronnie Yaya uh, completely dominating against uh, Mizuta Hirota. Yaya is showing improved stand-up, and you know what's interesting about Ronnie Yaya is he's, you know, he's a real hot and cold guy, but when he has his takedowns working, he reminds me a lot of Damian Maya, like a really good grappler, jiu-jitsu guy but he can take you down what were your thoughts on this fight very impressive win it was a very impressive win for yaya you know he's uh won back-to-back -back fights since losing to chad mendez who's obviously went on to fight for the title against jose aldo so yaya is looking good at 45 you know he fought for the title at 35 in the wc against chase baby i guess right. i'll show you how long ago that was it was before the miguel torres run so you know he's been around for a long time and yeah i think the choke against grispy and then the dominant grappling performance against hirota was very good hirota's a three-time lightweight champion in japan right. so it's a very very good win and uh he obviously wanted that in his hometown or sorry home country and uh hirota's uh, been around for a long time so it's a great win for yaya and you got to wonder, you know, if he's going to start getting more contender fights because he's dangerous, but he's not a, exactly a guy that uh, moves the needle or, or sells a lot of tickets when it comes to the division. So very yeah. tough fighter, and I'd like to see him in a contender about next. I, he's definitely earned it. Yeah, you know, he's definitely kind of a, a high-risk, low-yield guy because a lot of guys have beaten him, but at the same time, if if he gets you down on the ground, he can take you down or he can pull guard. I mean, he, he really reminds me of Maya that way. He's just a guy you just don't want to go to the mat with. Be interested to see what they do with him next. Now, considering high expectations, the UFC had really high expectations for the guy that lost our next bout, Hector Lombard, who was decision by Yushin Okami. Lombard looking his old vintage self, the guy that everybody fell in love with in Bellator when he destroyed Rusamar Paul Harris. Then he comes in against Okami and has a decent fight and comes on strong late. But uh, he kind of got Okami here. Uh, what you, would you take away from this fight? It was a great fight for Okami. You know, he went in there and he looked pretty comfortable in the stand-up against a dangerous guy in Lombard. And he did what he needed to do and taking the fight to the mat. And really, you know, Lombard didn't have anything on the ground. It was uh, very, right. very uh, intriguing to see that Okami could outwork him like that. And that Lombard didn't really have anything for him. Obviously, he scared Okami in the third. But I think uh, when it comes to Lombard, you know, there was none of the impressive or you know world-class uh ground game that right. he's been touted to have you know the the judo uh and that background didn't do anything for him against a, a guy in okami who is so really well-rounded grappler and he could be a nightmare for you if you're not a top 10 guy you know lombard uh top 10 guy potentially but there's a difference between being number 10 and being you know in the top three like okami consistently has been in his right. uh six-year run in the ufc so what do you I mean what do you do with okami he's kind of in a Kind of a nowhere land here, Dan. You have a lot of the middleweight division maybe booked or busy right now. Okami's lost the title shot, but he's beat Alan Belcher. Now he's beaten Lombard. Uh, what, what do you do with him if you're the UFC? If 
Bisping beats Belcher. I'd like to see Bisping versus Okami. You know, it's not the sexiest fight when it comes to the division, but <laughs> it'd be a way for Michael Bisping to maybe get back in there and uh, have a contender run if he's able to get past a guy like Yushin Okami. I, right. I think that's the role that Okami has in the division. Honestly, uh, he's already fought Anderson Silva, so it's a matter of, of him building a really great win streak, which he's certainly capable of doing, but he's, he's very John Fitch in that respect. Is totally. He's not going to get a title uh, fight unless he has an eight-fight win streak. Right, and you totally took the words out of my mouth. But I love having the show. He's the John Fitch of the middleweight division. Before Fitch was cruelly cut, I might add, he's he's way better than a gatekeeper. He's a really tough out, and uh, I, I just really enjoy the team. I think Lombard is just kind of one of those heavily muscled, explosive, high calf kind of guys, and he's super dangerous early. But if you frustrate him and move and kind of you know take the fight a little bit deep, I think his technique erodes a little bit, and he just. You know, although he came on strong in the third, you know, those big shots he was landing in the third, Danny, I was like, this should have been in the first round. You no, know? absolutely. And it, what was funny is uh, I made the comment on Twitter that he's actually got the same ground game as Mike Tyson, and that's the only apt comparison because everyone was like, Lombard's <laughs> like Mike Tyson, you know, he just destroys <laughs> guys. But it was completely overblown. Yes, very talented, but, you know, when you're mixing up against a guy like Yushin Okami who makes every fight his fight, uh, right. you're going to learn a lot about a fighter. And we learned a lot about Hector Lombard. One and two in the UFC, you know, losing to Tim Bush and Yushin Okami. Right. Not very uh, good losses to have if you're making a lot of money like, like Hector Lombard is. But right. very exciting for the division. I'd like to see him, you know, mix it up with the other power punchers at 185. Maybe with the Brian Stan. A Brian Stan, Hector right. Lombard is a fight that I'd absolutely love to see. I, I think it's a main event worthy fight when it comes to a, a fuel card. Obviously, Brian mm -hmm. Stan's going to have a lot of stock coming out of his loss with Vanderlei Silva. And Hector Lombard's a dangerous fight. You know, I, I think those are the kind of fights that makes sense for guys who don't really have a, a place in the contender uh, pool right now. Right. I think it's kind of the same thing you do with Alistair over him. You know, as soon as he loses, uh, you know, a fight maybe he shouldn't, send him in and gets another slugger. You know, at least get your, your money's worth out of the guy. And speaking of getting their, their money's worth, UFC sends Diego Sanchez down to lightweight or allegedly to lightweight. And uh, he you know, <laughs> can't make the weight. Big surprise. Cause I guess he hadn't weighed 155 since high school before he dropped down. Um, takes a close decision over Gomez. I thought it was kind of a, honestly, kind of a fight between two guys that are past their best. I mean, I've never thought Diego Sanchez should drop down to 155. He doesn't have the gas tank or the stamina. I know he's stronger in a pound for pound sense, but he just doesn't seem to have enough bullets. But he had enough tonight to beat Gomez. Did he have enough? I mean, did he deserve that decision, Danny? I don't think he earned the decision. His body kicks were very effective. That was the thing I was most impressed about with this bout. But uh, his card didn't hold up. I feel like Gomi just landed the cleaner shots. A very, very di uh, disputable decision. But I, I think at the end of the day, what sucks about it is that Diego Sanchez, you know, he, he rebounds from the Jake Ellenberger fight at right. 170, which was a great fight. But he didn't do it in a way that was impressive. And I think it really prevents a, a great story in talking to Gomi. Gomi was up for his third fight in a row. You know, he would have had two out of three in Japan. Uh, one of them would have been China. He, he looked great against Mac Danzig. He looked great in this fight. I think we, we've seen the Takanari Gomi really return to form. Right. And for him to have that decision is very heartbreaking, uh, especially because there was Gomi chance. The crowd was very uh, pro Gomi. And I think when you look at a guy like Gray Maynard fighting TJ Grant, you know, I think Takanori Gomi was in a position to get a fight with a real contender like a Gray Maynard uh, if he had won that fight. And he's not going to get that now because he's coming off a loss. And, and that's what I think was terrible about the decision. Obviously, uh, the judges don't make those considerations. But when you look at it, the fact that Gomi probably won that fight and he's not going to be in that position, it sucks. Because Gomi is a guy who has really revitalized his career. And he's done it under the gun of the UFC, which you can't say about a guy like Hector Lombard. Right. No, exactly. You know, remember Gomi coming in and really kind of tanking in his first couple of UFC fights. And it was tough to see him, you know, kind of struggling, you know, and, and hey, maybe we're all getting older, right? But I remember Prime talking to Oregomi against that version of Diego Sanchez, and I was just like, God, he would kill him, you know. Or maybe I just remember the, the you know, my younger days with uh, fondness that uh, isn't deserved. But speaking of our younger days and of younger, thinner, and better looking Mark Hunt at 266 pounds goes into the third round of a war against Stefan Struve and delivers a third round knockout that was straight out of the vintage pride days, finishes it with a right hand left hook combo and the walk away knockout. I mean, how awesome was that to see Hunt being Hunt? Mark Hunt, four fight win streak in the UFC, two walk off right. KOs and a broken jaw now. He added Stefan Struve's broken jaw to his... Uh, right. Gold that he's been collecting. I mean, really a great performance. Back-to-back -back wins in Japan for Mark Hunt. 
people got to uh, remember that when he came to the UFC, it was on a contractual technicality. The UFC right. had to give him a fight. Not only that, he lost to Sean McCorkle in his debut, and he hadn't won in uh, four years and six fights. Right. I mean, that's, that's a huge losing streak, and Dana didn't want him because he was fat. Mark Hunt is in full effect, a contender right now. I would love, absolutely love to see Mark Hunt versus Roy Nelson. It's a fight I've been talking about since he knocked out Czech Congo in Japan 12 months ago. Awesome. Now that we have Roy Nelson, Czech Congo, if Roy Nelson could get past Czech Congo, I think it makes a lot of sense to have a guy in a four-fight win streak in Hunt and the guy in a three-fight win streak in Nelson should he beat Czech Congo fight in a number one contender fight because Hunt and Nelson, they're both the same fighter, essentially, that they're older and they're on an unlikely run. and. Right. You Fresh face at heavyweight, you know it's going to be Kane Dos Santos three potentially. It could be Bigfoot over him too. I mean, uh, it's really those four guys who are in the mix at heavyweight. I, I think a guy like Hunt and a guy like Nelson could add a lot of intrigue to selling a, a good heavyweight fight. Uh, will they be competitive? I don't know, but I want to see the number one contender fight to get there. I mean, those guys are sluggers. They hit hard and they're able to take a lot of punishment. They're very resilient. I just yeah. want to see it. It'd be Pride Madness. So they should do it in Japan. I absolutely believe that fight should happen in Japan in the summer. Dude, the mullet versus the the Samoan. I mean, yeah. what better billing do you get than that? You know, you get all of your your uh, your different uh, demographics and constituents in there. And the thing about Hunt is, I thought his ground game, I mean, kind of looked a lot better. He was kind of brave, jumping in there. He jumped in Strew's guard a little bit, do a little ground pound, pass guard a couple times. You know, we all know he's got an amazing chin and power. And uh, what was interesting is in that third round, you know, I, I thought that uh, Kenny Florian had some great commentary about how Hunt is letting uh, Strew back in this fight, like by going to the ground instead of keeping it standing. But apparently he knew what he was doing. I, I can't believe we're saying this Roy Nelson versus uh, Mark Hunt for number one contender fight, right? Like, who I, you know, I actually can. I mean, Mark Hunt has fought the best in the world. It's just... He turned a, a corner in his career. He's able to defend the takedown long enough to look viable, and apparently he knows how to get side mount and work from there. I mean, it, it's a great move. And, you know, Roy Nelson, uh, black belt, uh, he's only lost to the top guys in the division, like Fabricio right. Doom and uh, Junior Dos Santos. So I, I think with him, if he's able to beat a guy like Hunt, you know, let him get his last hurrah. You put him on the ultimate fighter for a reason I can't explain. You know, I have no idea why he was an ultimate fighter. So, right. you know, he's been around for a long time. You've promoted him. And it, it would make sense if he's able to beat a guy like Mark Hunt, who's really surging. And I think that there is credence to the rally for Mark Hunt. You know, when he was supposed to fight and, and replace um, the, versus Junior Dos Santos when Frank Mira took it right. at C146 in May, the rally for Mark Hunt, I think it made a lot of sense because it was a stand-up fight. Perfect now, fight. He's, really, er, he's really earned his way regardless of, you know, the style matchup, the intrigue of, oh, he should fight Junior Dos Santos as the best boxer in the heavyweight division because he's a K-1 guy and it's intriguing. Now he's just intriguing because he's got the requisite win streak. Right, and you know, hey, whatever happens between Overham and Dos Santos, down the road, I'd love to see one of them against Hunt because Junior Dos Santos, you know, would probably stand the slow with him. Hopefully over him would. I mean, the guy, he's the only guy I know to take a full left high kick in the face from Crow Cop and, and shake it off, you know? Yeah, absolutely. If Mark Hunt and Alistair over him both lose their next fight, I'd love to see that fight. And we could be looking at Mark Hunt exiting Alistair over him from the UFC. Yeah. If that's, <laughs> that's right. Punching his ticket uh, back to uh, Horse Meatville. Uh, so <laughs> now for the main event, which was uh, a rollicking uh, brawl that ended in two rounds. Both guys heard. Vanderlei Silva, the axe murder, comes back in vintage form, taking a big win over Brian Sand. And about where he was marked up a lot, how big a win is this for Silva? Because, I mean, it's huge. It's in Japan. He's rallied. He comes from the brink. He's kind of nailed a couple times. He just crushes Stan. Uh, how big of a win is this for him uh, uh, in his UFC career at this point, Danny? Uh, I am absolutely not saying this from a Japanese pride MMA fanboy perspective, but I think right. we look at this fight objectively – and how great of a fight it was. It was probably the best sprint of a fight we've seen. It's definitely Vanderlei Silva's uh, best win in the UFC. Uh, you know, he's only had four of them since returning, and he's four and five. You know, he's still got a sub-500 record in the UFC. But when you're talking about Vanderlei Silva, a legend of legend in the sports, this is the kind of win that allows me to believe he should fight for the belt in 2013. You know, really? I think he fight the winner of Anderson Silva and Chris Weidman. I think that Chris Weidman is undoubtedly the number one contender, but when you're talking about entertainment, and when you're talking about stature and history in the sport, uh, a guy like Vanderlei Silva is always one win away from getting in there and mixing it up with the best. Uh, I think that when you have a, a lifelong career like he does, the same way that Randy Couture will always bounce back into a title fight, right. I think Vanderlei 
Silva's certainly earned that credence in. The fight with Rich Franklin, sure, he lost it, but he looked great. He's won two out of his last three. He beat Kung Lee, who starts Rich Franklin. Uh, I think there's a case for that. And, you know, it's a case that's crazy, sure, but at the same time, this is a crazy sport. You know, right. we're seeing. And who else is at middleweight? He should have long fighting for. Yeah, I mean, who else is at middleweight to really be big and sell? I mean, yeah, you know, the odds makers might, you know, yawn at Silva versus Silva, but it's going to draw huge. You're going to, I mean, you're going to sell tons of pay-per-views both here and internationally. And really, I mean, it's like, you know, after Weidman, I mean, I can't really think of anybody that's that marketable. I mean, it's, it's tough to send in Victor Belfort. Oh, the thing that was most encouraging about, about Vanderlei is he just looked really comfortable in there. You know, he got drilled a couple times, but boy, when they stepped in and, and engaged, seemed mostly on the cage, I mean, he kind of looked like the Vanderlei of old. Absolutely, you know, props to Brian Stan for making it a Dan Henderson, Vanderlei Silva esque fight. You know, right. he really wobbled Vanderlei and dropped him. I mean, there was times in that fight when both guys hit the mat, like they face planted, and it was just a, a wild west gunfight. Right. And you know, if you're watching an MMA fight, and at the end of five minutes, Vanderlei Silva is covered in blood, you know, you're watching something special, and that's what we got in Japan for this fight. I mean, really, the UFC knocked it out of the park, and thank. Thankfully, we had Mark Hunt and Beverly Silva turn that card around because, yes. it, you know, it was a lot of decisions. Uh, you know, I didn't mind the decisions, but it, it was definitely a slow night. We had, uh, what, nine consecutive decisions on the card? Oh, God, I know. The first, I think it was like the first four fights on the televised card, and all that uh, compressed violence certainly made up for it. So I want to thank you for joining us again on the show, Danny. Fans, uh, you want to drop Danny a line or find out what he's up to? Uh, Danny, where can uh, the people get hold of you? Twitter.com slash Acosta is legend, A-C-O-S-T-A is legend. Series 92, XM 208, Tuesdays at 1.30 Pacific Standard Time for the Acosta KO on Sirius Fight Club. Check me out on thewallverse.com and uh, also on Once I Was a Champion, excellent documentary uh, that's currently on pay-per-view, Amazon, iTunes, and uh, all that good stuff. Awesome. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, Danny. And Acosta is legend, believe me. I knew that <laughs> since the first time I saw the guy. Uh, I saw him across a crowded parking lot, and he was wearing a silver hat. And I said, this man's either a genius or an idiot. And he turned out to be the former. <laughs> so we will see you very next good, week. A very good assessment. I appreciate that. Oh, always, man. You know the folks always keep it real. Listen, folks, thanks for joining us on Everybody Talking Heads. And we will see you next time.